Good afternoon, Harlem and Harlems of the world. I am Terry Wisdom, and this is Harlem Network News. Harlem Network News is a new media platform that started at the onset of COVID, and we're still here. Uh, we really jumped in the deep water back in 2020 when we realized, and my background is in film and television for many, many years, and my partner has, uh, my partner Bernardo Ruby has been encouraging me to set up something. But once COVID started and, you know, people, Black people were walking around Harlem saying, we can't get it. And why were they saying we can't get it? Because they did not see their self on the media. So we jumped in the dive, you know, jumped deep in the you know, water and decided that we had to start Harlem Network News. And we have continued consistently every Sunday at four o'clock, just trying to bring the news and information. You know, it's super important for us to tell our own stories and that's what Harlem Network News does. Uh, we are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, YouTube, Clubhouse, HarlemNetworkNews.com, and soon to be on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, uh, public access TV to really expand uh, the platform. We know the work we're doing is extremely important. And even when we heard uh, Mayor Adams, uh, you know, just speak about how the media was covering him and starting some initiatives for black media, um, we plan to be a part. Uh, today, we have a very incredible sung and unsung Harlem hero, and that is in the person of Derek Perkison, who is uh, the New York uh, Chief of Staff uh, for National Action Network. So Derek, if you would just say hello to the audience and tell us who you are and whose you are. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> No, thank you, Terry. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this. Um, you are a leader. Thanks for picking up the leadership mantle during COVID. Like you said, you, you picked up the mantle during a hard time and when the community was in need and you have not missed a day. And let me tell you, working with Reverend Sharpton and he has a, a Saturday action rally every Saturday. He doesn't miss a Saturday. And the girls have the Nan Youth Huddle on Mondays. It, it's not easy to not miss a day. So I salute you and your leadership in the Harlem Network News for um, what, three years now. And I, and I salute you for being on this journey. Yes. So I'm Derek Perkinson. I'm with the National Action Network. I am the New York State Field Director as well as the Crisis Director for People in Need. Um, I've start, I work for the organization started by Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton 31 years ago, uh, wow. him and Michael Hardy, and they have been uh, fighting the good fight ever since. Um, we have chapters and committees, and I'll share more of that as we go. And in the capacity of field director, I'm in charge of the eight chapters, and the 13 chapters out of New York State, eight in New York City, and as well as the crisis operations here, along with Katrina Jefferson, Deborah Clark, uh, Arthur Robinson, Cova McCall, and others. Thank you. Okay, okay. So um, because Harlem Network News is really, um, dedicated to assuring that our community is informed and we all know knowledge is power, we never make any assumptions. Uh, for those of you who are just tuned in, uh, this is uh, Derek Perkison, who is the Chief of Staff for NAN National Action Network with Reverend Al Sharpton. And Derek, can you just tell us what is the National Action Network because we want to make sure everybody knows what we're talking about, okay? The National Action Network is a civil rights organization. Again, started by Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton and Attorney Michael Hardy uh, to combat the injustices and inequalities in our society, uh, to combat systemic racism, to combat uh, the, 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 the depression uh, of our community. So um, the National Action Network is sort of like, uh, when you have the police department uh, and the officer kills someone in the line of duty uh, and, and it shouldn't have happened and you know, the person shouldn't have died, there's no weapon involved, uh, they have a union to protect them. They have lawyers to protect them. They have a, a structure in place uh, that they still get paid and just be on desk duty or just get uh, go home for a couple of weeks and come back uh, to the same circumstances. So um, we are the... the 
the, the victims, uh, you know, union, so to speak, uh, when individuals are in trouble, uh, we, you know, they reach out to us and we, we answer the call uh, in any way we can. And we, we stay there, you know, when the cameras go away, we're still there. The family stay in touch, contacted with us, connected with us like they should, because they know it's genuine. And they, a lot of them join the fight. So, you know, that's what the National Action Network is. Okay. Um, how and why? Um, because I know uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, he has been on the scene uh, for a long time. I know he has always stated that he started ministering, you know, when he was in elementary school. And, you know, even one of my cousins went to high school with him. So um, I know he's been on the scene for a long time. But why and how did he actually uh, start the National a Na Action Network? How and why did that start and where did it start? Uh, it started here in New York City, here in Harlem, actually. Uh, he had a first office, was on 123rd Street, Madison Avenue, uh, back in 91. Uh, you started in the school first, and then we moved over there. And again, it was it was due to all the injustices. You had Bernard Getz, you had Tawana Brawley, you had Yusuf Hawkins, uh, you had individuals uh, who were getting, uh, you know, um, you know, murdered uh, unjustly. And and you know, his 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 message has always been: if it happens for one set of people a certain way, it should happen the other set of people a certain way. You know, justice should be just for everyone equal, equally across the board. So Reverend Sharpton has been around again longer than 31 years with just just with Nan. Reverend Sharpton has been doing this since four years old. He was a boy preacher at four years old, he traveling the country seven, eight, nine years old with Mahalia Jackson. Oh, yeah. You know, the biggest, biggest gospel singer of her time, of our time uh, at that time. Then he, you know, later got with William Jones and Jesse Jackson, then moved on to James Brown, who was the biggest at his time when he was running the country with him. So Reverend Sharpton has a vast, he was called to do some type of special work, and that's the work we're doing. Um, and he's just keep pushing. He takes care of himself every day, eats well, exercises, and he doesn't take a day off. And, and I'm, I'm honored and, and humbled to be working for a man like that. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And if you would just share, because I know people are dropping in, dropping out. And one good thing about Harlem Network News, um, you know, you can see us live on Facebook now, but you can always look back, check our Facebook page. And we broadcast live every Sunday at four o'clock, but at 7.30, we rebroadcast on our uh, YouTube channel to just assure that everybody can get it because everybody may not easily have access to uh, Facebook, but you know they may be able to just get straight in on YouTube. But um, you spoke about all of the things that Rev Reverend uh, Al Sharpton is doing, and you dropped a lot of names that are very powerful to all of us from Reverend Jesse Jackson, you know, Mahalia Jackson, James Brown. But when and now during the week can people listen to uh, Reverend Al Sharpton and find out what's been going on? Because ever since, uh, you know, the onset of COVID, you know, we've had like Black Lives Matter and we have had so many murders of our black men and women, uh, Breonna Taylor, George, you know, for, it's just gone on and on. And it was happening before that, but I don't know if because technology is, you know, more powerful where people can just throw their phones up, but it just seems like it's more than ever now. And it appears that um, Reverend Al Sharpton has eulogized so many of those who have been murdered. So if you would just share a little bit about, you know, how he gets involved with that and where we can hear him, it's Saturdays, this is Facebook, you know, just so people can really be informed and look at the backstory. You know, I know he's got a TV show, you know, on, I believe NBC. So if you could just, you know, let us know how people can get involved and also how they can uh, join the uh, National uh, Action Network. And what- Thank you, Tim. No, thank you. That was, that's a good question that you asked. And a lot of people do ask that question. And a lot of people say they don't know what Nan does. No, I didn't know Nan does do that. I didn't know Nan do this. Well, let me tell you this, you know, during the pandemic, 
the National National Network through the leadership of our, our founder, Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton, fed people seven days a week for 11 months straight, led by Katrina Jefferson. And that girl didn't take off a, a day uh, and, and 11 months straight. And I just I salute her. Um, you know, I did six days some of those days, but, you know, some of those days I couldn't do the seven days. So he's he's been doing that, the organization with World Food Kitchen um, or, as well. Um, we, he, he set together the chapters and committees. Um, the chapters and committees run so well. Um, in each borough, uh, the chapters produce the policy. And Rev Sharpton comes to the chapters and asks the committees uh, what their pros and cons of an issue is and what's their recommendation for the for the organization, for the chapter. So it works really well how you know, the volunteers in the crisis department uh, are invaluable. Uh, the crisis department has uh, over 30, 40 volunteers at the present moment nationwide is a national uh, department of uh, volunteers giving up their own time and to help individuals who call the crisis center at 877-626-4651. That's 877-626-4651. And, and, you know, people are getting help. Um, you know, we can't help everyone who calls with, with certain situations. However, we help as many people as possible. And uh, it's been, been very successful and fulfilling. Um, when you help someone and they get a, a resolution to their problem, like their crisis, it feels good uh, that they're happy. And then I'm happy as well that the team or I took care of it uh, in the organization. Uh, you know, put us in position to take care of it. So, um, and, and if you want to get involved, there's only $25 to be a member for the year. It's only $500 to be a lifetime member. Never have to worry about another due payment. And it's at uh, www.nationalactionnetwork.net. That's www3 www.3wordsnationalactionnetwork.net. This is where the action is at. Uh, Reverend Sharpton was just at the uh, correspondence uh, dinner at the White House uh, last night. Uh, he is a journalist. He is one of the uh, brightest political minds of our time, if not, um, you know, of all time, uh, as he uh, narrates the, the temperature of the nation. And he takes the temperature of the nation. Uh, he, you know, he's an avid reader, so he stays on top of everything that's going on. Uh, and again, he doesn't take a day off, so he's he's just locked in uh, on on the wickedness in high places and how and what we need to do and how we need to go about it. So he reports on that every Saturday here. 106 West 145th Street in Harlem, uh, in Harlem at the House of Justice. 106 West 145th Street in Harlem at the House of Justice. So you can catch him every Saturday right here, at nine to eleven, nine in the morning to eleven in the morning. Um, and you also can catch him on MSNBC, his own show, Saturday and Sunday, five to six. And they told him he wouldn't last six months on this show. And this man has been here almost going on twelve years. Um, and we also can catch him uh, on Morning Joe, Monday through Friday. He's on that show. Very, very, very frequent, as well as this morning, I caught him on a Sunday. He's working where? WBLS on the radio from 9 to 10. And, is, you know, I always try to catch him there. A lot of people call in. And he gives a lot of knowledge and, and, and a lot of insight on, on what's going on nationally and where we need to be and what we need to do. So, yeah, tune in. Okay, well, thank you very Don't much. Don't forget social media, Terry. You know, everything social media, National Action Network on Instagram, National Action Network on Facebook, National Action Network on Twitter. Okay. And Reverend Sharpton has his own Instagram and social media. So follow Rev Sharpton also on those platforms. Okay, that sounds fantastic. I see something in the chat that says um, Instagram and Twitter at Campaign Pappy, uh, I believe. I two one zero. Yeah, that's me. That's my social right. media. Okay. I'm going to put my okay. social media in there. Somebody it. hacked my old one. I'm building up my new one. So. Okay. Okay. That's fantastic. Shameless oh, plug. Be, uh, go for it. So before <laughs> we go um, further about the National uh, Action Network news, if you would just share a little bit about your background, uh, Derek, and I, I just love it because you know, with Harlem Network News, we have so many giants that come on and so many heroes, sung and unsung. And you certainly are one of those giants. So I always want our audience to understand how people got to where they are, because, you know, we're mentoring the community, we're mentoring ourselves. And when people see uh, people that look like them, 
um, doing things, it's important that they understand what the trajectory is. How did you get to where you are? How did you get started and why? You know, and, and what your journey was because then people can follow in those footsteps. <clears throat> and I know you are one of those brothers that holds the door open for folks. So absolutely, you can't you can't get yes. anywhere and not leave the door open behind you, or you know, as far as you get, that's right. that's, a, that's as far as the people get. So yeah, a little bit about my tra uh, trajectory was um, I've always been in sales and marketing since like twelve years old, eleven years old, selling newspapers, candy in the schools. Um, after upon graduation of of college um, in mortuary science, I realized I didn't like science. I didn't want to be in that field, and I got into sales and marketing um, for the next almost twenty five to twenty seven years. Uh, one day I was looking for extra income and my aunt Beverly said it was someone running for office in Queens that could use some help. It's $15 an hour, four hours a day. I said, okay, that's cool. I could fit that into my schedule. And uh, what I had to do was basically was sell a political candidate. And that was pretty easy to me, you know, so I just, you know, tried to find, um, you know, just be, how to be successful in this game. And it's caught the attention of a couple of people, one being Bertha Lewis of the Black Institute who uh, helped uh, steer Acorn and also steer Obama to become president, as well as uh, Mayor de Blasio, his uh, first term, as well as uh, Reverend Sharpton and Attorney Michael Hardy came to their attention as well. And uh, basically uh, was recruited to come to NAN a little bit. And, um, you know, and it's been, a, it's been a blessing in my life. So, you know, I speak to, when I speak around the country, when I speak to these children throughout the city, I, I stress uh, punctuality being on time. If you, you have to start work at nine o'clock, you don't get there at 8.55, you know, 8.57 is thinking you're on time. You're not, you know, 8.30 is with the time you need to get there. Um, I, I tell them about um, having a code of conduct with their social media and what they post, um, the, not the inappropriate stuff and not to wear their pants saggy, um, you know, showing their underwear. Um, it's not a good look. So, you know, I try to stress to these things and that's basically, you know, and God, God is, you know, the number one reason you gotta have a belief system in place because a lot of times we don't have a belief system and I, that's why i believe society with the gun violence and the uh the the, the, the anger uh, that we have towards each other is really out of control because um we're pumping this hip-hop and different things images into our children but then we, we don't have them being fed positive uh, energy and words and stuff like that um you know sort of you know i'm thinking about uh, when we go back to the church you know when people we go into church that's a positive environment you're getting positive words, positive message um, in, in the message. So we, we, we need more of that balance in our community because right now we only have one thing and that's just the promotion of black on black killing uh, and glorifying it and people getting money off of it, um, which is cool. You know, when we was trying to get out of certain circumstances but to keep perpetuating it, uh, it's not gonna be, you know, it's not gonna help us in the long run. So we need to find a way around that as well. Okay, well, thank you uh, for sharing that. And sh thank you so much for sharing your background. Um, because for you to say that you went to college and studied uh, mortuary science and then decided you didn't want to go in that direction, that's very powerful, you know, just in terms of, because especially um, now more than ever, uh, people don't just have one career. Um, you know, they may start at something, but they may have to multitask and do a few things. It's not like um, it was uh, sometime way back that, you know, you had one career and at the end of it, you got to go watch. You know, we're, we're not there. So, um, you know, it's interesting for you to have made that transition. And as we know, you know, just being here in Harlem and, you know, the great, uh, you know, funeral services that we have from Ventus to Owens, you know, that it is um, also a community service, you know, where people are connecting with people and helping people and, you know, promoting different things. So, you know, it, it's really all um, intertwined. So you just took that mortuary science and you put it into the living, you know. So I just think that- Indeed, indeed. Yeah, I think that's extremely powerful. So uh, this is Harlem Network News. I'm Terry Wisdom, and I'm here with uh, Derek uh, Perkinson, uh, who is with NAN. He is chief of staff here in New York. And Derek, if you could just share a bit, I know that we, uh, in April, 
just came off and this is uh, May 1st. So it's a powerful day here in Harlem. And I was out early this morning and uh, the marathon was going on. And I know my niece is riding in it and folks were coming through as early as nine o'clock, uh, you know, doing the marathon, which I believe started in Manhattan and will end up in uh, Staten Island. So it's a great day in Harlem as it is every day. But um, if you could share a bit about the National Action Network convention uh, that took place in April, how long that's been going on, and what some of the highlights of the convention uh, were this year. Thank you. Oh man, I'm glad you asked. So before we get to that, I just want to show you, we just did this this past Thursday. It's called NAN Legal Night. I don't know if oh. you can see it with the camera being right. blurred, but it's NAN Legal NAN Night. Legal Night. Um, okay. And, you know, because people say they don't know what we do. Every last Thursday of the month, we do a NAN legal night where you can speak to an attorney if you have any type of legal situation, housing, family, criminal, civil, and so forth. Um, okay. We just what did time? this this past. Okay, what time on Thursday nights and where? Um, the, the last Thursday is the last Thursday of each month at 6.45 p.m. 7 p.m. is when we start. We let people in the room at 6.45. This past Saturday, we had a virtual voters forum and financial literacy forum put on by New York City chapter and our political action committee. So we have a committee doing that. And the same day yesterday, we had a great uh, Kathy Jordan Sharpton scholarship fund hosted by the New York City chapter and the Women's Auxiliary C Committee. Nan's Women's Auxiliary um, also was a part of that. So hey. get into the action. And they always give about two or three kids a year scholarships with this hard work. So that's why I like to support and definitely see where the money goes and, and stuff like that. Um, also coming up May 7th, we have the NAN Disability Committee okay. New York City chapter hosting a virtual forum. Also, I'll send that out to you so you can share with your network. Thank you, Thank you so much. May 7th, I have a situation on AME Harlem at the Harlem International Film Festival. Uh, it's okay. called Blur the Color Lines. Uh, it's going to be I'm be hosting with Crystal uh, Work Walk and Grace Ming, and we're going to try to bridge a, a, a gap in our community with the Asian community and the Black community, Latino okay. community. Um, okay. You know, to keep us going on like this. So, in regards to the convention, this was a very, very uh, excellent convention. The panels, um, the, the segments was great. The plenary sessions. Um, so, I'm going to go over the whole schedule with you. So, we okay. kicked it off I love it. I love on it. that Wednesday. We kicked it off on that Wednesday at the ribbon cutting. Now I've had a lot of confirmations, Terry. I'm gonna tell you this, all these elected officials always confirm and they come to the House of Justice. For some reason, a lot of them were dropping out the last minute and I'm saying, what's going on? So, so it was another event that happened that morning. However, Reverend Sharpton was there. Dr. Franklin Richardson was there. Reverend Jesse Jackson showed up. Eric Adams came. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, Manhattan Borough President Mark Levine, City Council Member Eric Bacha, uh, Jennifer uh -huh. Jones Austin. Uh, it was numerous uh, uh, Reverend uh, K.W. Tullis from the West Coast. So it was a, it was a lot. Very well attended. Remember cutting. And you got a nice shot on your email. Uh, yes. Black. Yes. Yes. So immediately after that, Eric Adams hosted his uh, plenary sessions. The plenary session is you're asked about a specific policy issue and you speak to it in less than uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. So Eric Adams did uh, his plenary session and his plenary session was followed by Jamie Harrison of the Democratic National Committee, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, a national figure. And Jamie's plenary session was powerful as well. Um, and again, I, I would tell you know a little more about it, but I want people to go back to our, our website for one, www.nationalactionnetwork.net to look back at some of the footage themselves. And also you can go to YouTube, National Action Network on YouTube as well. So after Jamie Harrison, we had a politics and voter suppression in the midterm elections panel. It was moderated by Reverend Sharpton. The panelists were, check this out, Melanie Campbell, the president and CEO, National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, convener, Black Women's Roundtable. We also had my good friend, Christina Gray, Associate Professor of Political Science over at Fordham University. Okay. We had the Honorable Alicia Reese, Vice President, Hamilton County Commissioner and Board Member, National Board Directors for NAN. We had Jermani Williams, New York City Public Advocate. 
So yeah. that was the panel for that. They spoke very powerful about what, what's the need, what's going on, voter um, suppression, and so on. The next panel was with moderator Ben Crump called Police Reform. And the panelists were Gwen, Gwen Carr, the mother of Eric Garner, Wanda Cooper Jones, mother of Ahmed Aubrey, Alicia Finley, sister of Botham Jean, and the president of the Botham Jean Foundation. We had Felonious Floyd, the brother of George Floyd. We had Bridget Floyd, the sister of George Floyd, co-founder of the George Floyd Foundation, Sabrina Fulton, mother of Trayvon Martin, Jakari Harris, executive director of George Floyd Memorial Foundation, and Karen Wells, mother of Amir Locke. Very powerful. And right after that, we did a press conference uh, about the decision uh, that the officers uh, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be, uh, identity wouldn't be um, shared. So, wow. So that was, that was really powerful to have that at that time. The next plenary sessions, uh, the two in a row, was with Bell Oribidari Addy. He's with the UK Parliament and chair of the all party parliamentary group on Black maternal health. And it was really good um, hearing uh, the, the need over there. And I see my sister in Brooklyn, New York State Assembly member Latrice Walker doing a lot on mater uh, maternal health and the needs in that community. Um, Dr. Glenda Glover, the president of Tennessee State University and international president CEO of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority also had a great plenary session on the need and the work of our Greeks. We had the Honorable Tom Swazi, the Congressman out of Long Island, running for governor of New York. We had the award-winning rapper and recording artist, Fat Joe. And then we had the role of public pension plans and creating a secure retirement while creating community impact. That was Robert Green, President and CEO, National Association of Investment Companies, was the moderator. We had Tom DiNapoli, the New York State Controller, Brad Lander, New York City Controller. We had Stephen Kamak, Executive Director in Private Equity Investment. We had Carrie Lee, Senior Advisor, Minority Business Development Agency. And we had Don Peebles, Chairman and CEO of Peebles Court. Then we had the great Keepers of the Dream Ball and Gala. And that was very well attended. My good sister, um, awards. You got to see who won awards. I, I don't want, I want to spoil it. I want y'all to oh. see it just. <laughs> So yeah, we had a, we, and I could go through the whole thing, but that first day was just so impactful. Um, I want to talk about it, but um, the second day, I'll just skim through a few things that, that came through. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, it was, it was the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Secretary, uh, the Honorable Xavier Bacara. Uh, he came and he spoke about the needs in our community as well. And we asked him questions and policy that he would address for our community. Marsha Fudge, she's a superstar. She's done. She's the 18th secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. We need to support the system and watch her and because uh, she knows the issues and she's on top of it. Um, we had a, a media panel. Uh, Reverend Sharpton and Eric Michael Dyson also spoke a uh, fireside chat, which was powerful. The women's luncheon was so, so good. Um, the governor stood us up last minute. She couldn't make it. Uh, running the state. However, Hillary Clinton came, Jenna Jones Austin, wow. Ebony Riley, um, uh, Kristen Clark, the, the assistant attend, uh, attorney general for civil rights, the U.S. Department of Justice also was there, Tom, Tom Young, Young Lombard, and also Rachel Norlinger. Um, we had Jamal Watson do some things uh, uh, discussing his panel with the high, the role of the Black intellectuals uh, and with Eric Dyson and Dr. Williams of, of wow. St. University, St. Thomas. Wow, um, wow. Then we had the Truth to Gospel um, concert. Um, and, it, and it was great. So I, I encourage people to look back. I could, I could read two more days of this stuff. And then Saturday night uh, was the, the, the parties that whole day Saturday with the Nan Youth Huddle wow. and, uh, taking over with the fashion show, the, uh, the talent show, uh, the music, the gun violence panel. It was just, it was just powerful, man. There was measuring the movement. Um, they was talking about cancel culture or some rappers. So yeah, people need to tune in and check it out. Okay. Well, thank you so, so much. And um, I was out of town on family business. So I couldn't attend, but I have attended in person. And I'm like, as you're telling me that all these people were there from Jesse Jack, Amanda Adams to Hillary 
Clinton to uh, Marsha Fudd. I mean, this is an amazing lineup. And just the fact that people could actually come in here, ask questions and be part of the panel. Um, how well, um, and this is Harlem Network News, I'm Terry Wisdom. And uh, we're here with um, our uh, chief of staff of NAN in uh, New York City. Uh, and that is in the person of Derek Ferguson. And we were just talking about the NAN uh, 2022 convention. But how can people, uh, you can look back on the YouTube and Facebook and really um, you know, immerse yourself in it if you couldn't be there in person. And then hopefully next year, you will be there in person. Now, how is Jesse Jackson doing? And we don't want to assume everybody knows everything. Who is Jesse Jackson? Well, you Jesse know, Jackson is one of, one of our city. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Jackson, we could talk about him all day, but you know, to me, uh, he came to my attention when he was the first black man running for president, uh, okay. Jesse Jackson. Uh, I was about 12, 13 years old. Um, and Jesse Jackson, um, you know, he's been fighting for our rights ever since. He keeps hope alive and he tells us, I am some, I'm somebody. I am somebody. I so, am somebody. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Jesse Jackson, you know, he, he uh, probably have Alzheimer's, he's bad in some illness conditions, mm -hmm. but he still gets around. He's very knowledgeable in what you're saying to him and, and, and says some things back. But he's just moving a little slow with his age. He's almost 80 years old. So you have to understand. So Jesse Jackson's our leader. Got to spend time with him and Dr. Hazel Dukes. It was great. Um, taking care of them up front and, um, you know, being attentive to them and what they needs were uh, before the ribbon cutting. Um, so, yeah, Dr. Jack, Dr. Jackson is uh, a pastor, a reverend, a civil rights leader, an icon, uh, someone uh, who uh, we adore and admire. Okay. Well, that's amazing. And uh, we know that uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson is truly um, a warrior. I know he was earlier this year, I believe, dealing with COVID, but, you know, he came out, I know he has a book out, he came to a book signing, you know, and so um, these are the people uh, whose uh, shoes we have to fill. So it's very powerful and things are very much connected because I know in reading um, our uh, first lady, Michelle Obama's book, you know, she kind of tells a story about going to school and she went to school with one of Jesse Jackson's daughters and they were great friends. And she said, you know, Reverend Jackson used to pick him up from school sometime. And, um, you know, he would always, you know, maybe be late because he was at a, you know, rally or something and he would pick him up. And she said, and then we'd have to go to the rally and wait till it was over. So it shows you the cross pollination oh. that happens in life. Yes. Yep. Yep. That's how so, it happens. About yeah. that. so it's a great thing. Now, what's coming up? You just got off of with Nan. Uh, you just came off the um, convention. What's coming up now? What's on the list? I know we have a lot going on in the world. <laughs> and you talk about voter suppression. And, you know, the truth of the matter is that, um, you know, there's some of the lowest voter turnout in the country right here in New York City. You know, and I'm not just saying like the Black people, it's everyone. And I'm not sure you know, really what that's about. I don't know if people are just so overwhelmed with living um, that they just, you know, don't take out the time and realize the great impact that it has on their lives, or if they're just feeling like they don't have power and it doesn't matter. But I know we have a lot going on. The primaries um, are getting pushed back because um, of the redrawing of the you know, the, the voter districts, you know, so there's a lot going on. So it's important that we try to engage the community and let them know this matters. So what things are happening and not to mention, and this is a, a huge thing, um, you know, our former state uh, Senator, uh, Brian Benjamin, um, who was appointed um, to Lieutenant Governor there's a situation, as most of you know, um, it's all over the news. It, he was arrested, um, arrested for um, a campaign fraud, and he uh, actually stepped down as lieutenant governor. Now we don't have, I don't even as a journalist have all of the full details. Um, 
I'm hoping to be able to get Brian Benjamin on to speak for himself or his counterparts so that we can really understand what happened. But because he's from Harlem and we were all out there at the state office building when he was appointed, it kind of reflects like, okay, how does this impact our community? What can we do? What's the real truth of the matter and how do we move forward? And I know that um, I don't have the date, but I know one of our organizations, we act, and I got a phone call just because I'm a voter that they're going to be having some forums on who's up for Lieutenant Governor. And I do believe that um, Brian Benjamin, I don't know if he's off the ballot or they're trying to get him off the ballot, but can you talk a little bit to that? Because it's, it's more about um, our knowledge and what we need to do. And of course, our prayers are with Brian Benjamin and the family and um, you know, just for things to get right. So if you would just speak a little bit um, about that. No, we're all praying for Brian and his family. Uh, he has a new family, he just had a daughter. Uh, we, have, we have no comment as to his charges until we yeah. get outcome of proceedings and we'll go from there. But we're praying for Brian and his family at this time. It's definitely unfortunate uh, if these things are true, but uh, there were, those things will never be the same for him. But yeah, it was just, a, it was just good to have a direct uh, connection from Harlem uh, in, in Albany in the governor's office, in the lieutenant governor's office. So um, a lot of things will get done. A lot of things will get addressed uh, with Brian there. Uh, and now we'll see who will who, who'll be there next. Uh, and again, that's what all of these statements about uh, is having access to individuals to hear your concerns and hear uh, the, the issues that's in our community that's hurting us and the, and the changes that, you know, possible that could be made to help the community and, and, and lessen the pain and the impact of the pain. So. Um, yes, it, it really hurt uh, for the brother, to, um, you know, to be charged and accused of these things. And uh, we'll see where it goes from here. But we definitely stand with him. He, he's a friend. Um, and, and, you know, we stand with him and we pray with him and his family. Pray okay. for him. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And that raises another issue because I know you, um, I believe you were able to get up to Albany. And uh, just at the same time that all of this was unfolding, um, it was also the uh, uh, caucus, you know, the Black caucus, the uh, Puerto Rican caucus, and the Asian caucus uh, took place um, up in Albany a couple of weeks ago over the three days. And can you tell us, this is Harlem Network News and I'm Terry Wisdom, but can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I know that that happens every year. And what kinds of things happen there? And what part um, did you play or Reverend Sharkin play? in that caucus, thank you. Oh, actually, Nan didn't play any role in that caucus because oh. uh, they held it this year. Uh, they normally have the uh, uh, Black, uh, Hispanic, Black, Latino, Asian caucus weekend, they call it. Uh, they normally have it in February. So oh. uh, this year due to COVID pandemic, switching things around, they chose to have it the same week as our convention. Therefore, I couldn't. I couldn't attend. Um, Rev couldn't attend. He was at the White House. Uh, you know, half of those that one of those half days. Um, so um, th there's no really role to be played at the same time. Uh, but all the uh, electeds gather. So that's pretty powerful in itself. When you have all the electeds in one room, at one weekend at different events. If you have uh, again different issues, policies, um, or um, concerns. Um, damage that's being done to our community is good is, is, is a place to speak up but it's also a place for them to have fun they letting loose it's sort of like uh that's the weekend before spring break it's not spring break week but it's the, you know but the week after that monday when they come back from albany weekend a caucus weekend uh they they're on vacation um oh, so okay so you you know that's a little extra motivation too. So you know you take care of business with certain panels. There's a lot of panel discussions going on, a lot of vending tables. Um, it's a lot of action and traffic coming through. Uh, everything is structured, organized. So there's a lot of different panels happening at the same time. Some are happening in the morning and afternoon uh, that you maybe want to uh, attend and, and see what's going on um, as well. So they're speaking about a lot of things. Um, so um, being that is is hosted by the electeds, that means something too because they're bringing up. Uh, bills that that their conference is speaking about, they're talking about. So if they're talking about these bills and these things that we need to hear 
uh, about how they're being created and, and uh, make sure they're tight and impactful for our community in a positive way. Okay, okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, what's on the hot plate uh, for Nan and for yourself uh, as we're moving through May, June and going on into the summer? Okay, well, Reverend Sharpton gave a mandate um, in light of the... the um, I didn't understand. In light, in light of the no knock warrant killings of Deanna Taylor, um, the young brother, uh, Mayor Locke, hmm. um, the other young brother who just got shot in the back of the head. We have to, um, he, put, he gave us our marching orders on that. No, no, no knock warrant, uh, federal level has to be uh, dismantled. It has to be, uh, you know, revised. It has to be in. Uh, we can't just run in people's home, have the wrong name, have the wrong home, and able to just kill someone in their in their own home who's minding their business. Uh, if you're not safe in your own home, where are you safe at? So yeah, that's being a, a challenge as well as the George Floyd justice policing, as well as the John Lewis Voting Rights Act bill. So we are, um, you know, in, trying to enhance uh, my personal, uh, not personal, but my uh, local uh, campaign here uh, is ending qualified immunity statewide. I know nationally, Rev. Sharpton and Nan, we're pushing on that as well. Uh, but statewide, we are also trying to end qualified immunity. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. That's um, a bit of a, a segue as you even mentioned those things. And it's, um, it's just a lot that we're dealing with here in our community, um, you know, in terms of the gun violence um, that happened and I know that even at your march on Washington, you know, you had like all of the families of those who have lost loved ones, you know, to gun violence. And a lot of those um, have lost lives to gun violence, you know, due to police or to no knock and all those kinds of things, you know, but there's a whole sea of people and I'm a part of that as well, um, as I know you well know, um, in November 5th of 2021, my own son, who is a son of Harlem, 43 years old, was shot and killed uh, on the Shinnecock Reservation in Long Island. And I will say his name, Ali Wisdom, Ali Sam Wayman Wisdom. And- Some peace, Ali you know, Wisdom. Yes, we are still um, looking to unravel who shot him, why they shot him, the person is on the loose, you know, snitches get stitches, so nobody's talking. And pretty much um, when a black person or a person of color gets shot, a lot of times it doesn't get the same help to solve the case, you know, as other cases. You know, there's disparities and everything. So it's almost like the family has to go out, you know, push in this case because it's what happened on a Native American reservation. The state police can only get involved, you know, and I do want to salute our uh, congressman for really reaching out to the Secretary of Interior, reaching out to the Department of Indian Affairs, and I'm still following up on that. And I have joined Harlem Mother Save, which I know, uh, I think they're going to be coming on the In Hope Tap Gary Bird Show on Sunday as Mother's Day. But there are so many um, mothers, fathers, you know, significant others that have lost... Um, family members to gun violence. And it's not just the police. So it's, you know, what is happening with the us killing us, but it's murder just riding in our community. So we have so much work to do with that and to understand that. And now, you know, the violence is even on another level. You're on the subway and they're shooting out and it's a this and a that. So um, the pervasiveness of the violence and not seeing like what's happening with the gun laws because it's all around us. You know, we even look at the January 6th situation, which ironically is my son's birthday. You know, that was his first birthday, you know, in, in you know, in heaven. So it's just, we got to look at what is this? Yeah. So what, what are the, no, what is Nan, who are you working with to really stop this violence and address, um, the gun situation that is pervasive in our country. And the no-knock thing, that's not new. 
I mean, I went to school with Gil Stein Heron at Lincoln University. We were friends, colleagues, and I read a lot of stuff he wrote when it was in a notebook. And, you know, one of his songs, and look how long it is, was called No Knock. And that was about mm. Fred. You know, so this is not a new thing. How many years? How many people? You know, so. Uh, no, um, I mean, no, it's been around a long time, We, you know, but we have to end it now. Again, we... Uh, but we have so many blacks in p positions of power. There has to be some real impactful change uh, because it's going to swing back. The pendulum will swing back. So in regards to who we're working with and what we're doing on gun violence, Reverend Sharpton just spoke at a, 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 a funeral for a young lady, just turned 16, cheerleader, honor roll student, uh, got stabbed by another young lady, 15 uh, years old, uh, and has died. Now, do you have two families heavily impacted? He spoke at the eulogy yesterday. I attended with him, and I think it's the oven. And he said, uh, you know, we cannot, you know, do this to ourselves. We have too much hate for ourselves. Uh, no other culture has this much hate and, and anger for, for each other, like, like African-Americans and minorities, black and brown people. So um, he speaks out against it. He has a big bull pit uh, with all the uh, various media platforms he has. So um, his, his megaphone is pretty loud. And uh, he will continue to speak up against gun violence in every shape or form and violence in, in our communities. He's all, he often says we have to protect ourselves from uh, the wickedness in high places, but also from people in our own community. And, you know, the, we got to protect ourselves from the cops and the robbers. You know, so we, we, you know, we have to protect ourselves on both levels. But we need to, you know, try to do more of a concerted effort uh, in our communities uh, to stop, you know, killing each other, stop being... Uh, disrespectful to each other. And how do we do that? We st each one of us start with the person in the mirror. The mm. person in the mirror, uh, you start there and say, you know what, I'm not going to argue, fight and fuss. I'm not going to curse at anyone today. Um, you know, uh, you know, and you keep it moving. So um, especially for someone of color. So, you know, you look in the mirror, let's start there. Let's, let's try to spread it out. And we start realizing who needs mental health help. A lot of people need yeah. mental health help, counseling, Whole bunch of things. So it's not just one layer of things, but uh, Reverend Sharpton has been speaking. Nan is always going to be the leader on these things, but um, we are not um, in the business of gun violence and things of that nature. So, so I don't mean to use it in the business of, but um, he holds police accountable. This is what the organization has been built upon, holding police accountable, getting voting rights, strengthening, and this is what we're focused on. So now you have a whole bunch of uh, cure violence programs out here. Shout out to the sister, uh, Aisha Say Cool. Shout out to John uh, from Guns Down, Life Up. Shout out to uh, Shandu McFadden out in Brooklyn. Uh, G Mac, uh, Gangsters making astronomical change. So these, uh, shout out to Life Camp out in Queens. Erica Ford, the queen, been doing it over 20, 25 years. Um, getting recognized by President Biden in her 25th year, putting this work in, uh, in the community and, you know, talking to people, victims, and stopping retaliation, stopping uh, gun violence. So, um, we have to give the kids something to look forward to. Uh, children, our children uh, committing these acts 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. Uh, that's way too young. So what are they looking forward to in life? So let's start there. Let's see what economic opportunities, let's see what educational opportunity for those who have dyslexia. A lot of people, um, is, you know, school prison pipeline is, is a lot of that concerns with not uh, taking a proper examinations, evaluations of our children at a young age to see what type of services they need um, so that can help them young so they won't accumulate and get worse as it gets older. So um, there's a lot of things we can be doing and hopefully um, Dan can be a part of that. If anyone ever asks, we have a whole bunch of ideas. A lot of them are, you know, happily it was picked up by Mayor Eric Adams, who was original NAN member. Uh, he oh. signed in cooperation papers 31 years ago. So wow. he had someone with us on the front lines that's now, uh, you know, from the suites to the suites. From the streets to the suites, <laughs> make him, and we know where he stands and where his heart is at. So, so we're very encouraged by the things that we're seeing. But again, there's always going to be a fight because there's no equality yet. Until everything's equality, equality, and liberation, we have nothing. Yeah. yeah, there's so much going on, so much work to do, but you just have to go step by step, which I believe um, Nan is doing. Um, are you having any uh, interventions or, or work or comments um, on what's going on at uh, Rikers Island and um, you know, uh, doing it or the federal government um, 
Is Nan involved in, in any of those initiatives? Well, I've been involved in, in, in uh, Rikers Island the coalitions to close Rikers Island. I'm involved in um, a coalition to uh, fair housing and individuals coming home. Um, so, yes, um, Nan is part of Close Rikers Island. I don't believe Rikers Island that that, we, that those acres could be used and utilized for something uh, better, uh, more equitable for the community. Um, and I'm not of a, a belief that not everyone, no one should be incarcerated or for a crime. Um, some people have, you know, have to be incarcerated. Some people have to be in solitary confinement. I'm part of a campaign, halt solitary confinement, but I know there are individuals if they're trying to hurt other inmates and hurt the police, the corrections officers, they may need to go in solitary confinement. So um, we have to talk about these things and what's the you know, real issues, but yes, we think not um, Rikers Island should be closed um, and, and other facilities, more suitable living facilities should be created. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. And lastly, um, this is Harlem Network News. I'm Terry Wisdom, and I'm here uh, with Derek Ferguson, uh, Chief of uh, Staff for uh, National Action Network in New York. And we've had a very robust discussion in terms of what's going on with the National Action Network uh, as we speak and going forward. Um, are you all doing a march on Washington again this summer? Uh, can you just enlighten us on that? <laughs> Can't tell you all the secrets. Can't oh, tell you all the secrets. But listen, um, that's yet to be determined. We'll, we'll follow my, my leadership of Reverend Sharpton. Um, you know, he's pretty good at these things. You know, he's the master at planning, strategizing. Okay. So, um, but we do have, for sure, the Triumph Awards, the NAN Triumph Awards will be coming up. Hope to see you there. Um, we also have Reverend Sharpton's birthday coming up, oh. October 3rd. Yes, make sure, you know, I hope you see you there as well. Um, so, yeah, we may get a, 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 a march in before, a march to D.C. and before that. Uh, and then we'll go back into our Thanksgiving program, our, our, our Christmas program, Christmas Eve program, our Christmas program, and our King Day program. Okay. What can you share with the audience um, what the NAN uh, Triumph program is? What is that and when is that? Thank you. When we cele celebrate those in the struggle and social justice. Those who are speaking up for the voiceless, uh, those who, who are helping the under, under, underserved. So uh, we, we celebrate uh, usually people on one from each uh, category in life, arts, culture, music, uh, celebrity. Uh, so this is more of the, uh, uh, more of the uh, high profile event that we do uh, at, here at the National Action Network. Okay, and when is that coming up? Just so uh, again, we don't have the day right now, but normally it comes up in, in, in September, late September, early okay. October. Sometimes he sometimes he combines it with his birthday. Again, okay. depending on the numbers with COVID and if these things, because again, Ted, we're not out of this COVID thing yet. No, we not. all need to stay diligent. We all stay need to keep wearing masks and, and we all keep need to get uh, vaccinated and boosted. Now, I don't know how many boosters we're going to keep getting. They, you know, they keep suggesting a certain month, every six months, every year, we're going to get a booster. So I don't know how many times we're going to do that. But we you know we have to come to the realization that we may be living here, at least for our natural lives, I'm 51, uh, with COVID. We may we may go out with COVID, not go out as far as passing away, but you know, in our lifetime, we're gonna see COVID for the rest of our lifetime. Um, and it, you know, maybe our great grandkids or our grandkids will see a world where there's no more COVID, no more cancer, no more disease. But you know, for this for the for the immediate future, I see us living with this COVID, a different variants, uh, some stronger, some weaker. Um, we got to keep track of the hospital numbers, uh, the bed numbers, the ventilation. We still got to keep track of that stuff. And, uh, you know, stay diligent. We still have to wash our hands. I don't hear a lot of people speak about washing their hands. And, you know, like in the beginning, you know, in the very beginning, everybody's talking about it every day. But, you know, we get away from things. So we need to, you know, stay diligent until we really get it, get out of it. I think about June, July, we, we could be, you know, a little more freely, you know, but we still have to, you know, stay, stay protected. I think we have to steer the course. And I think uh, COVID, um, it's been horrific. <clears throat> it's really highlighted a lot of things. It's highlighted some of the disparities. It's highlighted the food insecurity. So um, it's been, um, in that sense, made people get more aware. And when it's coming directly to you or your health or, you know, folks dying and passing away, 
it gets your attention and it makes you have to deal a lot differently. So I'm with you. I think people still need to be diligent. I think, uh, you know, we need to, you know, just make sure we're eating right. We're getting our exercise. We're doing all of those things that are going to help us because as people of color, um, we are more stressed than others, just given the circumstances and things that we're living under. And the economic conditions have a lot to do with, you know, why there's mental illness, why there's drugs, you know, why the, you know, the schools aren't doing this. So, you know, we more than others, I know is growing up, you know, it was always your parent telling you, oh, you got to do three times as good, you know, to get through or whatever it is. But really we have to take extra care of ourselves. We may not have the same fresh fruits and vegetables in the community, so it's a lot. Um, if you could just, um, as we're moving out, Derek, just speak a little bit. And I know it's a very um, sensitive topic, but we have a lot going on in our community with developers coming in to Harlem, building buildings, and um, the buildings being unaffordable. And some of the developers just boldly stating, hey, we're not having any uh, affordable um, housing because we can't afford it. And it's a very frightening thing. And I think it's very impactful um, to the community. I know you and I sit on Community Board 10 and you've had a lot come before us. And I know there's the 145 uh, project that is happening on 145th Street and it's supposed to happen right there where National Action Network is happening. And you know, there's been coordinating for the National Action to stay where it is and also to do the Civil Rights um, Museum. Can you speak a little bit about that? And I know there's been a lot of pushback, you know, against um, those developers, but how is that flowing and how can that flow best for the community? If you could oh, just- Oh, thanks for saying that. Um, you know, the community was very against it. As you know, you and I sit on the community board. I recuse myself in all those things. Um, yeah. As hard as it was to see people attacking uh, my, my president founder, my organization, uh, without all the uh, correct information and not being able to speak up and share this information all the time. Um, and even what we did not to be able to reinforce it. Um, it was just, it was, it was, it was hard. It was hard. It was hard. I can't, I have to admit. Um, Cause I, I worked at that location every day. It was a young lady, a, a month or two ago, a uh, car, a, a guy was driving a car, older, older men, older gentleman, elder, senior, passed out at the way at 8, 15 in the morning. While this young lady's walking to the bus with her five, six year old son, um, and she didn't make it, she passed away a week ago after. And the young man is still, you know, fighting, but he's stable, but he's still traumatized for the rest of his life. Um, man was a part of taking care of that uh, portion, of those, a portion of that funeral as well, right across the street, Terry. I go to show, I go to that store twice a day on a good day. Uh, we had a co worker hit the lotto in that store uh, often. Um, so, um, you know, and then it, a couple of days ago, a guy gets shot on the corner here. The guy stands out here. The guy stands out all day, and it, it was a shootout right there on the corner, 144 from Lennox. Um, wow. I ordered that twice a day uh, to get a coffee, uh, you know, to get a break. So um, I know what's on that corner. I know uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning, 8.30, when I'm walking into my office, uh, you know, these gentlemen are waiting for the liquor store to open, uh, 8.39 in the morning. Um, and they stay there, you know, all day drinking is, you know, homeless guys over there. So it's, it's some things um, that needs to go over there. And again, it's the will. Reverend Shelton's position has always been what's best for the community. If the community is against it, he's against the project. Um, you know, if the community is not happy with it, you know, he's not trying to, you know, go against the will of the community. So that's, you know, that's what people have been missing here. Uh, yes, it, we, his desire is to have a civil rights museum. Yes, he feels a civil rights museum with a Northern perspective has never been, has never been achieved, never been done. Every time we think of civil rights, uh, we always think of Dr. King in the South. But what about all the civil rights battles and, and victories that we have up here in the North? Uh, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, uh, Frederick Douglass, and all these great ones that was over here. So um, that's his desire, but he's okay with whatever the community's uh, decision is. Um, it, it, so far, uh, you know, it's moving through the process. Um, you know, it's passed the ULA process and is on its way to the city council for a vote. So now it's up to the city council. 
our, our city councilwoman, Kristen Richardson Jordan, Kirsten Richardson Jordan. Um, she'll have to uh, speak to her counterparts uh, and, and, and get them to, you know, vote whatever she can do, or she can negotiate with the developer to see what, what's the, you know, what's the best, uh, you know, housing for the most part, everyone's complaining about, you know, uh, sh you know, sharing that the housing is inadequate. So yeah. at, at the end of the day, we need to get a better deal for housing, if that's the case. Yeah. 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 And that may, um, thank you for sharing that because that really may have to be um, legislated. You know, no one is saying that they don't want, you know, nice buildings, good housing, you know, stores that have good food. Nobody's saying that at all, but I think the critical thing is affordable housing for the people. And that may have to be legislated because developers are business people. And Terry? Terry? 